thank you very much, Ambassador Ray. Uh, Ambassador Prasad, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, great honor. Uh, I just take it as given that the very fact that we're all here is that we believe in the cause. Uh, and therefore, we can speak very frankly and honestly about the problems. Of course, we can talk about the positives, and there have been many positives. And I think uh, Ambassador Prasad did an excellent overview uh, that will enable me to drill down immediately more to the physical connectivity, which, of course, as you noted, and Ashok as well, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for connectivity. But the most important point is that I think we really need to take a very hard look at what has worked, but more importantly, what has not, and where do we go from here. So I take it in that spirit, and everything I say, I hope, will be taken in that spirit. Uh, I'll have uh, five points I'd like to make. Uh, first, that there is inadequate, though improving, connectivity within South Asia, uh, both in terms of quantity and quality. Uh, second point would be that the intra-regional connectivity, however, is poor, very poor. And some would say that we are a disconnected region, improving again, but disconnected. Uh, Third point is, I'll talk about South and Southeast Asia. Our borders are thick going west. They're probably better. Not probably, they are better going east. And how is that panning out? And how Northeast is the bridgehead to that connectivity? Uh, I'll talk a bit about China, uh, particularly the Belt Road Initiative. Is that a threat or is that an opportunity for South Asia? And the fifth and the last point, the point that uh, Ambassador Prasad made Ambassador Ray just mentioned it, I think, in a very appropriate way, that what are the uh, strategic efforts that South Asia needs to make to enhance connectivity, I believe is an existential challenge for us. So this will be the five points uh, that I'll, I'll focus on. Uh, first point is really on the connectivity within South Asia. I have to uh, uh, apologize. <laughs> that yesterday evening when I was mentioning to my daughter my presentation, she said, I've got 30 slides too many, maybe 40 too many. I have about 50. So please ignore the number of slides. I'll share them with you. I'll be happy to share them with you in case you want them. So uh, don't get put off by the number of slides. Uh, the second line here, that is India. Somehow India's name didn't come down here. And the immediately to its left is China. So India has the largest road network. Uh, in, in, Asia, in, in, in South Asia, uh, but, and the road density is high, but look at the growth of the road density. If you look at, uh, that, that is uh, the developing member countries, and if you look at India, the growth density has increased, and this is 2011, this is two, uh, 2000, so it has improved over time, but the issue that really is that it is not enough. And it is not just in quantity, it is also in quality. Again, this is a difficult one to read, but this basically shows the various countries and how it has changed over time. And you'll see that the blue line, which is the later year, is basically larger. It has grown, but not enough. Uh, this is the railroad density. And the railroad density, again, shows that South Asia has grown but not as much. China, for example, has grown almost at double the rate. And that is only to be expected, considering that China has inve invested roughly about 9% of its GDP over the 20-year period, 1990 to 2010, compared to India's, which was roughly about 46 And that, too, really in the later years. So India has really underinvested, actually. So have other South Asian countries. And it shows in China's quantity and quality. Let me just briefly talk about quality of the roads. And again, you'll see that improvement in uh, over the years. Uh, the blue line is uh, 2006, red is 2014. And in each case, it's an improvement. Uh, but notice that Sri Lanka is actually better than others in South Asia. And as a matter of fact, in terms of quality, is even better than China, which is, again, a remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, which goes to show the size doesn't necessarily always reflect in quality. This is on roads. Uh, this is on railways. Again, a very similar uh, phenomenon. This is on ports. 
this is on air transport. But basically, the point that comes out of this analysis is that quality and quantity of infrastructure is improving in South Asia. All those blues were uh, slightly longer than the reds, but sorry, these are reds are longer than the blues, uh, but there are considerable deficits. For example, in India, though we have the largest road network, uh, only about 56% of the roads are paved compared to roughly about 80% in China. And of course, that makes a big difference. So it's not just the quantity, but the quality which matters. But what I found striking and very encouraging is that Sri Lanka uh, is best in quality in South Asia on all the parameters I mentioned, and in some cases, actually parallel rivaling China. Okay, so that's about connectivity within, uh, within the uh, countries. But I think our greater concern really is intra-regional connectivity. And some have actually even said whether we are a disconnected region rather than a connected region. Uh, the connectivity is poor, uh, particularly west and what we call thick borders. Uh, and that is part which I think uh, Ambassador Prasad was also alluding to in terms of the challenges of connectivity going west, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, and the worrisome thing is it's actually worsening. Uh, though it is better and improving going east, partly of course reflection of uh, India's act east policy, converging with Thailand's west, look, look west policy, and BIMSTEC and some of the other initiatives I'll come to in a moment. But the broad conclusion I would put is that thick borders going west, thin borders going east. Uh, North-South connectivity, uh, long history of North-South connectivity between India, Nepal, Bhutan, but punctuated by periods of bruising disruptions. And I use those words with a lot of thought. And I'm very glad that we've got friends and colleagues from other parts of the region, uh, certainly Mr. Rana from Nepal, and we look forward to hearing more about that. Sri Lanka and Maldives connectivity is, of course, only by sea, though even there, there are plans envisaged of sub uh, over uh, sea connectivity between India and Sri Lanka, and I'll come to that later. But the consequence of this poor intra-regional connectivity leads to what I call the 52535 phenomenon. And the five is the 5% that Ambassador Prasad also mentioned about the intra-regional trade in South Asia, less than 5%, which is actually just a pity, considering that many parts of this region were actually one country some decades back. Compared to 25% in Southeast Asia, and almost 35% in East Asia. And when we talk about Southeast Asia, ASEAN, GMS that we talked about earlier, important to recognize also that till about 1990, a large part of that region was technically still at war. So the, the Indochina war didn't really get resolved till 1991, 92, and yet they now have almost five times the intra-regional trade that we do. And of course, compared to uh, Europe, it's about 60%. So it's a huge uh, gap, huge loss. Uh, and therefore, rightly, some people have called us a disconnected region. And it is ironic that it's cheaper for India to trade with Brazil than with Pakistan, uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, and the potential, therefore, for the region is huge. Uh, if, for example, uh, we could reduce the thickness of the border, we're not talking about become seamless. I think that is sort of, you know, probably unrealistic to expect in the immediate future, maybe in our lifetime. But even, sorry, but even if we were to make the border thin between India and Pakistan, the trade could increase six times. 3 billion to about 20 billion. And even that, I think, is an underestimate. Okay, And of course, going forward, and this is the whole point of the Kathmandu Summit Declaration. This was exactly the whole point of what Ambassador Prasad, I think, in his very uh, broad-ranging, eloquent address talked about, is what are the issues going forward? And these are the ones, connectivity, 
liberalized services, invest in the physical and software, uh, leverage private capital, and of course, eliminate tariffs, behind the border barriers, etc., which I'll come to, and of course, the people connectivity. The challenge for us in South Asia is not that we don't know the problem. This challenge, of course, is what to do about the problems and the solution. But this is, this is where we are. And I think it's fair to say that even in SARC, uh, there has been no lack of good intentions and planning. And we have the SARC master plan of transport connectivity, uh, which I think was a very well prepared uh, plan. Uh, it has got about 10 regional roadways uh, in, in this area. Uh, and you can see the concentration is really in Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh. This is part of India and then Pakistan. Uh, five regional rail corridors and railways, gateways, and 10 maritime gateways because you have a connectivity both on, sorry, uh, both on the east side uh, and, and on the west. Uh, the implementation, of course, remains very spotty, uh, and we'll, we'll come to that later. But the point is that in South Asia, <coughs> we're not wanting for plans. We're certainly wanting for implementation. Uh, SARC uh, road corridors, uh, SARC rail corridors, uh, South Asian information highway, in terms of getting consensus on the plans, we haven't done too badly. Uh, but it is really in the implementation that we have fallen short. And I think one of the reasons has been an issue of politics, issue of lack of trust, issue of financing, issue of sequencing, all the points that Ambassador Prasad mentioned. But the most challenging one was really a model in which uh, we never got past the design stage. The South Asian Information Highway, therefore, presents, I think, and I know that the minister will be here with us soon and talk more about it, <coughs> is digital connectivity. If we can't get things on the ground, and of course, you can never get away from that, can we do things which is much more connectivity, telecommunications, IT, uh, where the, the challenges are of a different kind, but is easier to, easier to overcome. But once again, notice that it is all eastwards. And I've not put the maps here to keep Pakistan out. I've put the maps here to show where the action is. And, and, and to me, that's a pity, because basically it is taking the western part, the thickness of the border is such that nothing seems to be sort of, you know, uh, penetrating that. But uh, obviously, a lot of, lot of potential. So South Asian road corridor, South Asian railroad corridor, South Asian information highway are all designed, they are planned, they are viable, they are financeable. I know that the Asian Development Bank has been very keen to put, put money uh, and so have the other multilaterals. Uh, energy uh, in exchange, the power grids, power grid connections between India and Pakistan, uh, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India. Again, the fortunate aspect of all of this is that the physical layout, because of the contiguity, makes it all relatively easy. And Ambassador Prasad was talking about the connectivity we made between Uzbekistan and, and, uh, and Afghanistan. Some of these things are much, much easier just because of the terrain. And therefore, there's absolutely no reason why this couldn't have been done, particularly, as I said, when this whole region was one market, not, to, not in the distant past. Uh, and again, similarly, uh, Sasek Energy Corridor projects about various uh, connectivity between Nepal and India, Nepal and Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, and even, even on the west. And if we can think of not a national grid, but a regional grid, which is essentially what would make sense. As I said, the Mekong countries, which are at war as late as the 90s, now have a regional power grid. So excess of power in Vietnam or a deficit of power in Thailand can get exchanged through Laos seamlessly. And there is no reason why this. And again, as I said, these energy corridor projects are not just 
to squiggles on a map, though they look like squiggles on this one. Uh, they are actually designed, they're actually technically viable and, and operationally viable, but uh, not, not, at that, not at the moment at least implemented. Uh, similarly, on the inland waterways, India, Bangladesh particularly, uh, have had a long history of riverine connectivity, and yet that connectivity was severed, and some efforts are being made now to revive it, uh, but uh, again, far from over. Similarly with Nepal, uh, many of the connectivity projects which are at the moment just road and railways can be of other multimodal variety as well, and not to mention with Pakistan. But the fact remains that all these connectivities that I've talked about uh, are effectively not implemented. This is why it led to, again, a, I think a very pragmatic response of what Ambassador Prasad referred to, that South Asian growth quadrangle, which basically is uh, SARC minus Afghanistan and Pakistan which is basically what is now being looked at going eastwards, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. Just let's see which projects we can get, get off the ground. Uh, which essentially leads to that hardware is necessary, and this is a point I think that Dr. Behuria was referring to. Hardware is necessary, but even more important is really the software. How, how do you get the institutional alignment, and this is why the BBIN motor vehicle agreement is such a breakthrough. It will allow for the first time, uh, after Bhutan endorses it, and I know there are lots of challenges on that, but it will allow for the first time for people to drive from Agartala to Dhaka, which is a three hour ride, uh, car ride, rather than flying to Calcutta and then flying to Dhaka. And even more ironic is going from Agartala to Silchar through stretches of Bangladesh rather than, as I did last week, fly from Agartala to Calcutta, then to Guwahati. So th those are the sort of thick borders that we are talking about. And again, as I said, I have to be very frank, this is not to be critical. I'm a part of this. I've been a part of this for 30 years. They're often unwelcoming and sometimes antagonistic borders. And if you and I have difficulties on those borders. Just imagine the trader who is trying to move his bundle of saris across the border, what they go through. And therefore, at or behind the border barriers is the biggest challenge. SAFTA has done one great thing that the tariffs have come down. As a matter of fact, they're almost non-existent. So there's no point of trying to worry too much about the tariff barriers. It's the beyond non-tariff barriers, behind the border barriers, which is a problem. As a matter of fact, many traders have told me that they would be quite happy to see some tariffs imposed, but then have the testing arrangements streamlined, that the behind the border barriers streamlined. And um, uh, um, we, we have seen uh, my good friend, Ambassador Yogi, is here. And, and you know the issues that we have had with trade in uh, Bangladesh and India. Jamdani Sari is coming from Bangladesh into India, which is really for the markets in Calcutta, has to go to a testing lab in Benares, and then back, and then in again. So it's those issues which are software, which are institutional, which are, the, which are still the major, major challenge. OK, so one of the issues coming out of the thick borders going west was people said, OK, what about connectivity eastwards? Because those are ex extremely important. And connecting South and Southeast Asia with the Northeast India as a bridgehead becomes a very major uh, uh, viable option. And therefore, the uh, regional cooperation programs of SARC, SASEC, BIMSTEC, ASEAN, these all start to take, take importance. And between South and Southeast Asia, again, a huge potential for improvements in trade. If you look at this one, this red one is the potential gain of trade if uh, <coughs> there was greater connectivity. And you can see that the, the, the proportions could be as high as 56 to 70 percent, so that even between South Asia and Southeast Asia, you could see an increase of trade by about 70 percent by better connectivity. 
not to mention what could have happened on the Sark side, where I showed it could be even as more than six times if it were with Pakistan. So inadequate connectivity is a major barrier. And uh, the Northeast role as a bridgehead, and I'll come to that in a moment, becomes very key. Because, and I know there's a session tomorrow on Northeast connectivity, which is critical. India cannot connect with its eastern neighbors if it is not connected within its own self first, if the northeastern part of India is not connected, and it is not at the moment, then you cannot connect India with Myanmar. And therefore, the whole issue of northeast connectivity becomes very, very critical. Uh, if these connectivities were in place, uh, then you'll see a proliferation of regional value chains which will come into place. Again, please don't worry too much about the squiggles on that. But basically, those pink arrows show the various regional value chains between India and Nepal, India and Bhutan, India and Bangladesh. Because the whole point of regional cooperation is that you become part of a regional production network or a, even a global production network. And this is what the Mekong countries have done so well in their integration with China and with ASEAN. Shoes made bits of the shoes made in Cambodia, bits of the shoes made in Vietnam, stitched together in Laos and shipped out through Vietnam again. So this part of the regional production network, which is actually a function of the thickness or the thinness of the border, will come to the fore if there is better connectivity. So the point here again is if you don't have connectivity in this northeast part, you can't obviously connect to Myanmar. You can't connect to northeast, uh, sorry, uh, eastern uh, part of uh, Asia. And it's very obvious. Agartala to Kolkata, if you had to go by the chicken's neck, the distance is roughly about 1,700 kilometers. And if you could go through Bangladesh, it's only 450. And therefore, the costs are a fraction. The distances are a fraction. And this is Agartala to Kolkata, and you take any other um, sort of in a combinations. The issue is, and I'll come back to this in a moment, something that Ambassador Ray referred to. The benefits are obvious that why isn't it happening? And I think we have to come back to this incidence of benefits and costs. But in terms of showing the benefits, nothing shows it better than just that first figure of the distances being almost triple if you can, if you have to go through your territory and a third if you go through through Bangladesh. Uh, again, uh, various economic corridors possible. Uh, this is uh, India's own growth quadrangle. Uh, and then connecting on to East Asia, there's the Sea Link. There is the Bangladesh corridor. This is the North-South corridor. The GMS, Greater Mekong subregion connectivity, enables us to link up with Bangladesh if, if this is built. Uh, the India, Myanmar, Thailand trilateral highway, which is in progress, uh, connecting India, Myanmar, and uh, Thailand. But key thing again will be if the northeast part of India gets connected first. Otherwise, some of these missing links are obviously not going to make this whole project come together. And the connectivity northeast, therefore, becomes very important. But if we can have, before I leave this, the India Myanmar Thailand Trilateral Highway, very high priority for all the three countries. Uh, unfortunately, five years behind schedule. Supposed to have been in place by 2015, now talking about 2020. Now, there are good reasons why some of the delays, but the fact is there are delays, and, and the delays are quite inordinate with consequences for, for uh, the trade and the movement. And I'm uh, sorry myself, Shabrashachi, that I'll miss your presentation tomorrow, but these are the points that I know that you will have a lot to talk about. Uh, once you can connect into Thailand, then of course you, the rest of the world is at your doorstep because then from Bangkok you've got all the connectivities already in place going to China, going south to Indonesia. You become part of a global, a regional global network. So the connectivity for South Asia to Southeast Asia is not just an end in itself. It's a means to an end of a much larger connectivity to the rest of the world through the Pacific. Uh, the Mekong India Economic Corridor that also Ambassador Prasad had alluded to, uh, which basically would connect maritime-wise. You go across the sea and then again up 
into Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and then again become a part of the, of the uh, ASEAN uh, network. The Trans-Asian Highway, again, a large part of it is a 141,000 kilometer network. A large part of it is already in place. Uh, buried in those squiggles are some uh, missing links, and this one shows it a bit better. Uh, some of the hatch lines are, are missing. But again, the UNSCAP and ADB have worked on this for about 20 years. The master plans up there. The protocols have been signed. Some of the missing links are being built. Uh, what is missing, of course, are institutional issues of trust and politics, which I think is the, at the crux of this whole challenge. But the fact is that in South, Southeast Asia connectivity, we are not talking just about plans. We are talking about projects on the ground. Of course, there are missing links, but they are actually there. The Trans-Asian Railway, similarly, uh, part of connecting Singapore all the way to Istanbul. A large part of it is there. Of course, there are missing links as well, which is being worked on. But let me show you something very interesting. Uh, this one is a transport corridor going from Istanbul to Yangon. And the exciting, interesting thing is that almost 90% of this network is in place. There are missing links, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, on the borders. But the infrastructure requirements for this connectivity is not huge. It is not insignificant, but it's not huge. And this plan actually has been endorsed by the Indian Railways business plan this year. So lots of exciting possibilities if you can connect Istanbul to, to Yangon uh, through the Asian Highway and the Trans-Asian Railway Network. And let me show you this. The economic feasibility of the inland transport um, network. The blue one is, of course, if you have to go by sea, and the red one is if you go by land. New Delhi to Ankara, New Delhi to Ankara, uh, if you went by the sea route compared to if you went by the land route, the cost difference is about 44% more by the land, 44% more, and almost a third in terms of number of days. Uh, if you take uh, New Delhi to Mandalay, going, going eastwards, again, 33% more cost and about 50% more in terms of time. So the benefits are huge. So the economics, the, the finances are, are obvious, engineering-wise feasible, but they still have to, have to come together. By the sea, uh, the project Sagarmala, India's project Sagarmala, which is basically India's initiative to take a port-led direct and indirect development. Again, a very positive uh, development. But if you come to think of it, this sea trades existed almost a 1,000 years back. So in a way, these are all re-emergence of routes which were already there, connectivities which were already, which were already there. And if you can develop those ports, then of course, new shipping routes between Sri Lanka and India and ASEAN. In Sri Lanka, of course, you know, you'll just need to connect this and you'll have a great connectivity between the markets. Uh, and yet, and again, I know my friends from Sri Lanka will illuminate us on this, just as Ranjit was mentioning about issues in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, the issues are, oh my God, if you have this connectivity, isn't that terrible? Uh, accepting, you know, People who have to go, who shouldn't be going, go anyways. They don't wait for an uh, undersea bridge or a tunnel. Uh, and the people who need to go can't go because of lack of connectivity. And I think that's the logic that we'll have to, we'll have to work on. Uh, let me give you an example of a multimodal uh, connectivity project uh, involving, again, India and, and, and Myanmar, which is a very attractive one. This is the uh, Kalaran multimodal transport project under implementation, connecting really Calcutta with Aizwal in Mizoram. But the route is down to the port, across the Bay of Bengal, into Sitwe, up the Kaladan River, and then by land into Mizoram. Uh, and, and again, great benefits of costs, great benefits in terms of time, 
and all of them eminently doable. I think the point that I keep bringing back is that none of these are just pie in the sky thoughts. These are technically viable, these are economically viable, there are financing viabilities as well uh, in place, but something needs to come together and that something is politics. Uh, but in this case, the project is going quite well and should be in place, I would, I would think, in the next year or so, but I could be wrong on that, give or take. Let me move very quickly uh, to China. Uh, we obviously can't talk about South Asian connectivity, Southeast Asia connectivity without talking about China. And the linkages of South Asia with China obviously would, could either go through Bangladesh, through the Chicken Snake, Northeast, uh, through the famous Stillwell Road would be one possibility. Uh, this is the Bangladesh, sorry, Kunming uh, Kolkata Highway that uh, Ambassador Prasad had referred to, the BCIM. Uh, going from Kunming uh, through uh, Jashor to Dhaka, uh, Silet, Silchar, uh, Mandalay, and then into Dalian, uh, Dali, and then on to Kunming. Uh, again, uh, technically viable because some of these links were already there in the uh, pre independence days. The challenge here is geostrategic and a very understandable one. India wishes to pursue east-west connectivity. China wants to pursue north-south connectivity. China wants to get in through Myanmar into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, these are strategic, geostrategic issues. And of course, it is more dramatically reflected in China's talk of the Belt Road Initiative. I shouldn't say talk. It's much more than a talk. It's a very real uh, program as far as they are concerned. Uh, it's a massive program which will run through continents of uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. It will involve about 65 countries. It will involve about 4.4 billion people who will be affected. And it will account for about 40% of global GDP. Now, this is China's geostrategic plan and a reality in many senses. They have created, along with others, and of course, India is very included in that, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The main purpose is really, in a way, to see that these projects happen. The challenge for us is, uh, how do you react to it? Uh, I think we'll have to take, and this we, I think, is more India than South Asia, we'll have to take a much more strategic look. We have to be proactive rather than reactive. Our saying it shouldn't happen is not going to make any difference. China is going to do it anyways. Uh, I think it's also not fair of India to ask some of the smaller South Asian countries not to take benefits of the resources coming through the one belt, one road. The challenge, therefore, is, and again, uh, Ambassador Prasad, is such a wonderful overview that I keep referring to him because it was there, is how does India sort of respond? India has to respond with uh, deep pockets of its own. India has to respond with projects of its own, and many of those projects I mentioned, the India-Myanmar Trilateral Highway, Sasek Corridor, the energy exchange are part of it. So India will have to, I think, engage proactively and strategically, but there's no getting away from the fact that we'll need deep pockets, because China is putting money on the table, and large amounts of it. And I've been in negotiations when I knew that I was going to be completely blown over because at the end of the day, if somebody comes with a $10 billion check, it's difficult to say no. And quite frankly, then you have to wonder whether you should or you shouldn't. But that leads me to my last point, Shev, and I know that I've run over time, is the need for greater and strategic efforts by South Asia to enhance connectivity, which I think is an existential challenge for us. Uh, the, obviously, the software and the hardware aspects I've talked about. The economics of connectivity are favorable. Finance is a challenge, but manageable. The greatest challenge really are institutional and political. And I think South Asia, in particular India, will have to significantly enhance our efforts politically, diplomatically, financially to achieve greater connectivity. And here I'd like to take just a moment to build on a point that Ambassador Ray mentioned, that the general climate world over is against globalization, is against regionalization. And I think the reason is that those of us, and all of us in this room are believers, 
I think we've done a very bad job of selling our case. We have just believed it to be self-evident, and therefore we said, what's there to defend? What's there to talk about? Benefits of regional cooperation are obvious. It may be obvious, but we have to make a case, and the point is that the incidence of costs and benefits are asymmetrical. Everybody does not benefit the same way, and the costs are not borne equally either. And therefore, those who lose have to be either compensated, not either, they have to be compensated, but more importantly, a case has to be made to them that why is it in the interest of Bangladesh to allow transit from Kolkata to Agartala through Bangladesh, when the obvious beneficiaries are people in India. But Bangladesh also does benefit, and I believe that it's a win-win proposition. But I think, Ambassador Ray, we have to make a much better case about the incidence of costs and benefits. And I was very encouraged by Ambassador Prasad making a very, very strong point that the larger partners in South Asia being India, in East Asia, Southeast Asia being China or Japan, we might have to just take a greater share of the burden. That's just the nature of the uh, equation because the benefits of regional cooperation accrue to all. And as a matter of fact, some of the larger countries, India in this case, probably going to benefit even more. So, as a good Bengali, of course, I cannot not somehow bring in Tagore. So here he is. About 100 years back, he wrote a poem, and I'm paraphrasing it. He said, Debe ya nibe milabe milibe. Basically, you will give and you will take, you will integrate and get integrated. And if the poet had the foresight to pen this 100 years back, surely we can rise to his challenge. I believe we can, and I believe we must. Thank you very much.